Welcome back, Tiger fans, to Rockin' Radio's football podcast. I'm Nate Edwards. That's Brandon BK Kylie. This is before the box score. Just the everybody come together, take a knee, grab each other's hands. Let's kumbaya this. Let's kumbaya. We're okay. BK, I'm okay. Are you okay? I'm freaking out, man. I'm freaking out. <laughs> oh, I know. It's okay. I'm on the good stuff, so we can we can chat and you can freak out. We'll we'll have a good time. This is so like foreign to me. The notion that I am the one that is negative BK, and you are over here just saying, "Hey, it's all good, dude. It's all good. We're fine. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong. Weird game. They'll be fine. Uh, yeah. So we'll get into that. Yeah. It's it was a fluky game, and I. I can understand and appreciate the optics of what we watched for 60 minutes last night. Messed up, weird, not good. Here's the thing. Middle Tennessee took us into the twilight zone, just pummeled us into darkness in the exact way that they wanted to play. Mizzou played their game on offense. Middle Tennessee played their game on offense. And we ended up kind of where it should be, where Mizzou moved the ball fine, Clinched up on fourth, and Middle Tennessee played like they had nothing to lose because they didn't, and hit on key explosive plays to keep it close. So this is where we're at. In case you have literally no idea, and like we are your only source of Mizzou news, which I'm sorry, but um, Missouri won last night, despite what you would think happened uh, via social media. 23-19, which I don't know if you all subscribe to Scoregami, which is unique scores throughout football, but... Kind of feel like 23-19 might be up there. Um, BK, I know you're freaking out, and I understand why. Is there one overwhelming thought going through your head as to why everything is bad and what's fueling your freaking out? That it feels the same. Like, that that's mostly it. Like, it, it's not so much any one thing that happened in that game. Because I've seen that game, like, repeatedly over the last... I mean, really, we can go back seven or eight years but specifically over the last four it it feels like so many other games that we've watched from Eli Drinkwitz where he gets conservative the game ends up being close in part because of his decision making in part because he doesn't have a quality quarterback I I think Brady Cook was mostly fine outside of like the early portion of that game but we'll get to that later um but all, for a million different reasons that game felt all too familiar to Mizzou fans. An early season game against a lesser opponent that you feel like you should beat by two or three scores. And we said it was going to be ugly, but it was uglier than even, I think, either of us expected it to be. Yeah. It, it it just it felt like so many games that we've seen before. It felt like Central Michigan. It, it felt like last year, I mean, to a lesser degree, Abilene Christian. Um, and that's a problem. It, it shouldn't be that way in year four. In year four, you shouldn't win by four points at home against Middle Tennessee. It, it just shouldn't happen. And we'll we'll get into all of the reasons as to why it happened and how it may not be something that is like a repeatable experience against other teams down the road, but that specific outcome cannot happen for Eli Drinkwitz. It, it was a horrible look. And if you're a Mizzou fan today saying the wind has been taken out of my sails, you have every reason to to feel that way. You are totally justified in feeling that way. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, I get it. I think the big problem is that Eli Drinkwitz football, trademark Eli Drinkwitz football, is just an ugly, no fun experience. And I don't know exactly where that came from. Obviously, you can go back through his coaching stops. You can look at Arkansas State. You can look at Boise State. You look at NC State and then App State and then here. And, you know, offensively, they run the same stuff between, you know, Arkansas, Boise, NC State. NC State was kind of fluky, but um, he had a fluky group of skill position players. We won't dive into that. But he has he has been very consistent in how he runs his offense. And it's not working here. And I think one of the big problems is that when he was at Boise, he was playing – he was he was calling plays for a team that had a 20 spot recruiting advantage over the next closest recruiting power in the Mountain West. And when he was running that at App State, he was running hold on, I wrote it down. His five year 
Oh my God. His five year recruiting average at App State in 2019 was 32 spots higher than the next closest Sun Belt team he was playing against. That is why he could oh, run wow. outside zone with that offensive line and those running backs and just clear house because they were going up against a bunch of dudes who were going to be selling insurance the next year. And that's that's fine. That's how he learned to call offensive plays to run a team that one year. The frustrating thing for me is that it's not changing. And maybe that is just who he is. He's going to run his book and he's going to get an offensive coordinator who shares philosophies and the, a similar book. And that is how he wants to, to run his team. Maybe that's just it. And you don't know this when you hire a coach who's had 10 games of experience as a head coach. When you're looking to replace your old one, you just kind of go off of, you know, reputation and what you think is good and like, oh, he's young and like all, all that stuff. So you didn't really know what he was going to do. It's the stubbornness in the perceived stubbornness and not changing, even though we talked about how he was going to change all off season. And then this propensity to clinch up and fourth down. Because we can talk about third down as much as you want. Because they didn't have good third downs. But it's the fourth down decisions. And thank God he's not running that crappy fourth and one fake and play. But, like, it's the fourth downs where he will not go for it against an FCS team or a G5 defense in plus territory, even plus 20 territory. He won't do it. He won't do it. And, BK, you had a really good way of describing this. But it's like he's got a thing for feet. I'll let you explain a little bit further because that's ambiguous, but go ahead. Yeah, I I, I respect that. Uh, it's not a fetish specifically with feet, but it might be um, in football at least. So the old adage in football for coaches in, you know, the 70s and 80s was every drive that ends in a kick is a su- successful drive. If you punt, if you have a PAT, if you have a field goal, that is a successful drive because you did not shoot yourself in the foot. You didn't turn it over to the other team, right? And so coaches that came up under that belief believe in punting. It's the right thing to do. If you don't get a first down in the first three downs, well, then we punt and we live to fight another down. And hopefully the defense goes out there and does their job. And I think for Eli Drinkwitz, his philosophy, not just like the idea of what he, no, his football philosophy is that after the game on Saturday, he was asked about the decision to punt on fourth and one in the fourth quarter. Now, this was at the Middle Tennessee State 44-yard line. You're in plus territory. You're up 23 to 10, so you're up 13 points there. You got 10-25 to play. You could put this game away by going for it here and potentially drive down into Middle Tennessee State territory even further. This is what he said. Quote, up 13, if they've got to go 83 yards, their chance of scoring are a lot less than they are on the 50 I think it's the right call every time, end quote. Here's why I view that as an unacceptable response. Not just one I disagree with, but an unacceptable response. is because the only thing that he's taking into account in that scenario is if they fail. He is not thinking about what it adds to your estimated winning percentage if you get it. Because by punting, what you are doing, because I'll go the opposite way, right? I'll say, hey, what if your defense fails? What if you end up allowing them to go down to score? Which happened more often than not when Mizzou punted in these situations on Saturday, by the way. And if you end up allowing them to score, well, now it's a one possession game late in the fourth quarter against Middle Tennessee. And we know how this works, dude. It's just like in the tournament when the underdog has a little bit of momentum. Suddenly, the whole game shifts. The atmosphere shifts. Everybody at Furrow Field gets the tight cheeks. Because they've seen this with Mizzou before against that team. Not even that long ago. You don't have to go back to your ancestors, dude. This was 20, what, 16? 26. Mizzou lost that game against that team in those uniforms. That coach was on the other Mm -hmm. sidelines. So, yeah, you can believe that. You can go about it that way. But it's eventually going to get you beat. It didn't this time, but it will eventually. You had fourth and three from midfield and a scoreless game with uh, 10 minutes to play in the first quarter. You punted. Fourth and two from the Missouri 41, up three to nothing late in the first quarter. Punt. And then fourth and one from the middle Tennessee 44, up 23-10 with 10 minutes to go. Punted. That's embarrassing. It can't happen. And it happens every single time with this coach, dude. 
the game decision making for Eli Drinkwood puts his team at a disadvantage. And I'm so sick of watching it, man. And he tells us that we don't know what we're talking about. And all. I don't even care like how he talks about it. But the fact that his actions continue to be this misaligned with 21st century football <laughs> is embarrassing to me. It is. It's an affront to the intelligent football fans that are watching this team. And for him to continue to go out there and put his team at this disadvantage, dude, like there's a lot that we can get into as to what went wrong in that game. The single biggest disadvantage that Missouri had in that game was its football coach who put them behind when it came to decision makings on fourth downs in particular. The greatest con that Eli Drinkwitz has pulled on us so far was him relinquishing play calling duties to another offensive coordinator, but retaining the final say on whether you go for fourth down or not. That was the con because you can give it to a young kid who wants to prove himself and is a little bit of aggressive and maybe runs your stuff, but does a little bit better. You can do that. And then you can rip, rip the rug right out from under him because you're scared at not getting a fourth and one on the 44 against a G5 team, up 13. That's that's how you neuter your advantages. And that's, like you said, that's what he did. And to make it even worse is that it, t- it took Middle Tennessee like three plays to get back to where they would have been if Missouri had gone for it and failed. Because this is Middle Tennessee. It's all explosive plays. They will get one. They will land a few per drive. And they did every single drive. They landed at least one. So I don't know what to tell you. I mean, real life sports are a lot harder than video games. But I have seen Madden tournaments with more competent game management than what we're seeing from the Missouri sideline right now. And, you know... I, I, I call it an NFL mindset where sometimes the NFL is so dang conservative, so afraid of losing rather than winning that they will punt and plus tear it. Kirk Ferentz does this at Iowa all the time. Punt, 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 punt. Now, he also has a top five defense every single year, so okay. But like, it, I always grew so disillusioned with the NFL because it was such a conservative style of play with literally the greatest football players in the world. And I couldn't deal with it. I know it's changed a little bit, but like, it's such an outdated antiquated way of viewing football when you have a mobile quarterback you have pretty decent skill position players and you're going up against a team that has less talent than you like i'm i know that's your philosophy i know that's what you think this is going to be working but it, it's got to evolve it has to evolve and i i don't know i don't know if it will frankly i just don't and if this is how he's going to coach at mizzou it puts a heavy ceiling on what Missouri can be. Because think about the upsets that you've seen in college football, like the really big upsets. And think about what had to happen for those teams to come up with them. Hell, use his old example of being at Boise. I know he was only there for a short period of time, but like Boise State, you think about the biggest wins that they've had in their program's history. The one that comes to mind immediately is Oklahoma. Think about how they did that. Like they got super aggressive, dude. Mm-hmm. They pulled out trick plays, fourth down conversions, like everything you can do to be able to take that margin of error, take that margin of talent and slim it down a little bit. That's what they did. And with Eli Drinkwitz, it's almost the opposite where he is now allowing the other team to do that, where he is saying, no, we're only going to play by the book. And therefore, it is going to be easier for you to close this margin of error for you. If you go out there, you get a few explosives, it makes it easier for you to stick close. If you go out there, you get a couple of turnovers, maybe, it makes it easier for you. There's a safety, for example, it makes it easier for you. All of these different things add up to, we have such a small margin for error, if you're Eli Drinkwitz, that you have to do everything perfectly. So Mm -hmm. if you go out there and you have some horribly timed pre-snap penalties it feels like the end of the world if you have a couple of plays where your corner has perfect coverage and they've got a dude out there who suddenly becomes like prime Terrell Owens going up and getting it like Justin Olsen went up there and had like three or four just huge plays 
that were just inconceivable as to how they happened. Mm -hmm. But hey, man, sometimes that's the way that the ball breaks for you. And when you're doing this on the other side of things, as you're, if you're Eli Drinkwitz, it just makes all of that stuff hurt that much more. It makes it that much more of a dagger to your heart as it's taking place. So he, he's not going to fix it. I know that in my heart of hearts. And that's what makes it so hard to bear. What we watched on Saturday is, I think that was kind of almost the final straw for me. It's like I touched the stove so many times and I was like, next time it's not going to be as hot. And there was reason to believe this time that it was going to change because what she said is totally true, Nate. The biggest con that he's done is he said, hey, I'm giving up play calling duties. Now I can focus on the in-game decisions and I'm going to be better at it. I took that as, oh, he's going to be better at the things that I care about, <laughs> which is on me. He didn't say that specifically. He didn't say, hey, I'm going to suddenly become super aggressive on fourth downs. He just said, I'm going to get better with in-game decision-making. He's probably thinking like, hey, that means that I'm going to be better about like, hey, if the, if my offensive coordinator calls X and I want to do Y in a specific situation, I will be clear-headed to be able to tell him, hey, I'm going to have final authority. I think this is the right play here. So it, I conned myself into it as much as Eli Drinkwitz conned me into it. And that's what sucks, dude, is we got firm evidence that nothing has changed with his in-game decision-making. Nothing. At the same time, this team is better than it was last year. Oh. And I know the Come optics. On, dude. You don't I know the that. I do believe it. And I know the optics aren't there. And we're, I know we're two games in. So this is tiny, small sample sizes. But Missouri's running game is reeling off 50% success rates multiple games in a row. Granted, FCS team, Middle Tennessee, understand. But right now, two games in, light years better than we were two games in in 2022 or 2021. The passing game, I know it's not flashy. It's suffering from drops. It's suffering from drops. Not overthrows, not underthrows, although they do exist. Drops. That's the problem. The success rate of the passing game is better at this point th this year than it the first two games in the past two years. Again, weird sample set to use. It's what I have. Here's the other thing I want to tell you. This blew me away. I understand that people's relationship with SP Plus is a little bit different than mine. I, some people use it as a reference point. Some use it, people use it as a tool. We're going to use it here because I think it's really, really interesting to point out. Okay? How many times, BK, do you think Eli Drinkwitz has lost to a team that's worse than Mizzou and SP+. Plus. How many times has he done that in his three years and two games? Because we are going to count 2020. Interesting. Um, not many, because I feel like he is kind of the Kentucky, right? Where it's like you are a reflection of what you do against Missouri. Um, I'm trying to think if Boston College would have been better or worse than Missouri at the time. That's the one that is immediately coming to mind. I'll, I'll say one just because that's the one that comes to mind. One time. Boston College. You nailed right. it. Do you know how many times Eli Drinkwitz has beaten a team better than his in SP Plus in the past three years oh, and two games? It can't be often. Um, like two? Which two would you think? I don't know how SP plus viewed South Carolina last year. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Was it Florida a couple of years ago? And then maybe one of the wins in 2020, but that season just all kind of crumbles for me. Sure. So, so you got those two. He's done it seven times. Oh, wow. Really? Years. Okay. LSU in 2020, which we all know, even for LSU's explosion, they were still better than Mizzou in 2020. So he beat LSU. He beat Kentucky in 2020, which, again, mm -hmm. if you want to quantify that, that's fine. He's beaten Arkansas twice. Arkansas is usually better than Missouri and SP+. He's beaten South Carolina twice, and he's beaten Florida. Okay? So however you want to view that, that's fine. Notice there's no non-cons in there, but uh, they also tend to schedule non-cons. Yeah, that's you know, not surprising. About the same. Do you want to take a gander at how many times Barry Odom beat a team that was better than him in SP Plus? Oh, dude, that was that was one of my biggest frustrations with Barry yeah. is that Mizzou didn't punch up. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I can't imagine it was many. What, what was it, like three or four? Three? Two. Okay. Two times. Arkansas and Florida. Do you know do you know how many times he lost to a team worse than him in SP plus? Oh, too many. <laughs> <laughs> far, far far too many. He didn't punch up and he sure didn't punch down yeah. very well. Are Let's we walk like through four. Middle Tennessee, Kentucky three times. God. South Carolina three times. Jeez. Purdue, Texas, Oklahoma State, Wyoming, and Vanderbilt. Twelve times in four years. He lost My to a team worse than him in SP plus. So look, I'm not saying you either get Eli Drinkwitz or you get Barry Odom. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that this reductive hamburger thought process that he has in offense tends to not lose to worse teams and, and, and tends to beat, every once in a while, a couple of better teams because, like you said, you shrink the game, you take the margins down, and while it can bite you in the butt when you play worse teams, it can also give you a chance against better teams. And that is just, again, that might just be the Eli Drinkwitz experience that we have to get used to, and I hate it, but that might just be how we play, which is just high heart attack anxiety the entire time. Sometimes you get one, but you're not going to fall on your butt, and I don't know how I feel about that. How do you feel? So uh, here's the thing. I I think college football, I, I think it really comes down to, like, what do you want as a fan? Really, because like this, this way of living makes it pretty likely on a consistent basis you're going to win like seven games with the way that Eli Drinkwitz is now recruiting. You're going to win seven games pretty regularly playing this way. Do you care about getting to 10? Because winning 10 games this way is going to be remarkably difficult. It makes it so incredibly hard to punch up in a meaningful way in this conference. Dude, Texas is, like, maybe not all the way back, but they're back. Um, And that's a team that you're going to have to contend with now. Tennessee, even if they're, like, not what they were a year ago, that offense kind of runs itself for the most part, even when they've got Joe Milton, who has the arm accuracy of me and Nate, maybe even worse than the two of us. Um, Georgia's really good. Alabama, LSU, like, we can go through the conference. There's a lot of really good teams in this conference, man. Really good programs is maybe the more important way to put it. And then you add in the way that Missouri schedules, and like every year they've got at least one kind of 50-50 game in non-con. Getting to 10 wins like this is freaking hard, dude, unless you have the talent of a Georgia, Tennessee, Texas, Alabama. You can play this way as those teams and win 10 games pretty regularly. Hell, Texas A&M is trying to do this. They did it last year. They won five games with the most talented roster they've ever had. And... That is why I just look at it and I say, this is not the way to live, dude. It's just not. And if you want to play this way against Middle Tennessee and you just want me to say this is wrong, whatever. I guess I can live with that. But if they play the same way and they operate the same way with decision making against Kansas State that they did against Middle Tennessee, they will lose. Yes. You will lose that game. You cannot beat that team with the same kind of decision-making that you had a week ago. So that's where it really comes out to, is there still a place for Eli Drinkwitz to change? And I don't know the answer to that question. My my guess is no, because we haven't seen it now for three and a half years. So typically you would say, yeah, that's not going to change. But I guess next week is kind of the, the final straw of figuring it out. I mean... I know there there were some some fire Eli thoughts last night um, as the game went on and they, they couldn't pull away. And I get it. But if you no-show against Kansas State a year after getting no-showed <laughs> at their place. And, dude, this team's good. K- they K- are State's very good. Legit. They, they are, are very good. Contenders. By the yeah. way, um, have you seen Bill Connolly's uh, updated projections? He just put them out moments ago. We're, we're recording not. this on Sunday night. No. Have you yeah. seen the SP Plus projections for this game? I have not. No. What would you guess they are? I would say Kansas State is a 70% chance to win. Yeah. Is that it? He's got K-State projected to win 30-20 to 20 with a 72% chance to win this game. Okay. The spread is uh, two and a half, three and a half. Oh, five uh, I and a half. Four the spread is five and a half. Excuse oh, okay. Me. I saw four this afternoon when it opened. Uh, 
So yeah, it's trending towards K State or you know, way. It's it's trending in the bad direction. I um, mean, last week it was at one. It was. Now it's at yeah. five and a half. Yeah, which it makes sense. Like that's the correct way to go about that. Yeah. I would still take K State by the way. Look, man. Points. I'll, yeah. Um, I don't think there's going to be unless unless he gets fourth down powers taken away from him. I don't think we're ever going to see a comfortable Missouri win. I just, I don't. It's always going to be caveated by something. You know, even Abilene Christian last year, like, couldn't play the couldn't play the younger guys, couldn't pull away enough. He always plays his guys. They always tend to be old, and he's going to punt on fourth down. Okay. We t- like, this is a free-flowing conversation tonight. Yeah. Can we talk about some of the point gun? Yeah, or lack thereof, yeah. So you look on the defensive side of the ball, and it's like, okay, like the guys that you could kind of expect to play, they play, and they, they rotate a bunch of dudes in and out of there. They've got some depth on that side of the ball. They've recruited pretty well on that side of the ball. The um, the transfers have mostly worked out on that side of the ball. Like, all right, it's it's kind of going as you would expect. The offense, the guys that are getting out there are the same dudes that we've seen, and it's the old guys, like. Theo Weiss, through two games, has played 135 of the 138 possible snaps. What? Hey, what, what? What are we doing there? Mookie Cooper has played 125 snaps. What has Mookie... targets? <laughs> Three? Three has, targets? Has Mookie... Listen, man, I, I want to say this up front because I, sometimes, especially when we're talking about college kids, people hear stuff and they're like, you guys are being so mean to a player. And I'm not trying to do that. I promise you. I like Mookie personally. I think I, I've heard some of the stuff that he did with like Gabe DeArmond on the podcast. It seems like a genuinely great kid, and I'm glad he's at Mizzou. He has one target for five yards on the season. He has been out there for like 95% of the plays. He's running wind sprints right now. He is not a meaningful piece of your offense, and yet other guys who are better than him right now, or at least are more productive than him, are not able to play because they're stuck behind him. I think... Water. Because they think he's a good blocker. And that's just it's, it's silly, dude. Makai Miller is a better football player today than Mookie Cooper has shown in his, what, three years now at Mizzou. Mm-hmm. It, so I just, I mean, how much have we heard about Brett Norfleet? Dude could barely get onto the football field. He can get targeted, but yeah, it's like two. T- and, and to be fair, like he, he dropped that first pass and that wasn't a good look for him at all. But uh, Nate Pete barely played despite being, uh, I think, the clearly superior running back on Saturday. Last night? Yeah, absolutely. We have not seen either of the two other running backs that they have found that they identified in recruiting, and they told us all camp are really good football players. So I just... And this is Eli Drinkwitz. This is the thing that makes me so frustrated, Nate, is the stuff that Eli Drinkwitz doesn't touch. The defense. It's improved significantly over the last couple of seasons. The stuff that he does touch, the offense, the special special teams, teams, it's not getting any better. Mm -hmm. Isn't that at some point a direct reflection of him? And I'm not saying he needs to be fired. I'm not coming here calling for any heads. But this stuff starts to get alarming when you see it over and over again. And we're now into year four, which is... It's put up or shut up time, dude. Like he he needs this to be a good season for him. He does. He does. He is he is a great peacetime general. He will build up your army. He'll train him right. He'll get him psyched to get into involved. You know, he'll get the funding. He'll get you all the cool toys. He'll get you excited. And then the bulls start flying and he crawls into a foxhole. And he needs somebody else to lead him out. And that's that's fine. Not everyone can be a wartime general. Those are rare dudes and you need the peacetime as well as the wartime he needs to focus on being mizzou's pitch man he needs to focus on being the face of the program he needs to focus on creating nil laws to give us an unfair advantage against everybody else he needs to focus on getting high school kids in evaluating transfer talent getting all those dudes in there and then keeping your roster that's what he needs to do anything football the game related the tactics the schemes the 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 opening script the decision making. He needs to hire. He needs to hire you, BK. He's to hire somebody. He needs to get some other headset on there. He needs to sit there and like 
you know, play on his phone during the game and just let, you know, text, text recruits and then let somebody else go out there and take care of everything else because you know, it, it's, it is apparent what he has touched and it is either getting strangled or, or worse. And I don't know why. I don't know what the answer is, but he's got to let other people cook because it's not, it's not working. Yeah, that, that, he just needs like some 20 year old kid who just grew up playing all of the Madden, just all of the Madden. Then that's that's the best way to go about this is just find somebody that's going to be hyper aggressive and hopefully that'll put them into more advantageous situations. Um, all right, that that's a lot on trick quotes. We should talk about the quarterback. No, you know what? Let's do something positive real quick, just for a sec. Two things. One, Luther Burden is exactly who he, who he was projected to be. That dude is... I am so glad they have him in his natural position. He was just not... He, he wasn't winning regularly on the outside. He's winning more often this year in contested catch situations. He's still not the best at it, but he's better at it this year. And that's fine. That's a really hard thing to win with. But the way that he's winning both down the field and after the catch, this is the type of of jump that we saw a year ago with Dominic Lovett. Mm-hmm. He he looks like a five-star talent who's going up against kids that are inferior talent-wise to him. Um and that's that is super encouraging to see from Luther Burden. He he's been awesome so far. After the catch is where I've been most impressed. For it's sure. those those tunnel screens. I mean, you know, route running is what it is, you know, contested catches they are what they are. But yeah, like him finishing a screen, I don't care what your foe is. Like, he is just stomping over fools. And I know you can't do that in the SEC, but, man, it is just so impressive. He's just he's so much more comfortable, and he's so much more confident, and that just leads to so much more when you're a football player. So, yes, 100%. He, is, I, he hasn't made the full leap yet, but he is well on his way. I agree. Um, his yards after catch, by the way, uh, I'm looking at this up at Pro Football Focus right now. Last year... Um, or this year on the season, his yards after catch numbers are 8.4 per reception. He's at 126 yards after the catch so far this year. Um, and he's at 210 yards total. So, yeah, about 60-70% of his yards are coming after the catch. That's super impressive, man. That's, that's well done by him. Good job, Luther. The other thing to bring up that is a positive... Defense pretty good, man. Defense might be better than it was a year ago. It's yeah. deeper. They got a bunch of dudes. They rotate these guys in and out. I've been super impressed by that. Um, I, I think they should ditch the whole idea of playing um what's his face? Uh Darius Robinson at defensive end. He's not an end. We saw him uh like trying to contain the edge in this game. Didn't go well. He's not a defensive end. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with him not being a defensive end. You have developed now some guys that can play edge rusher. Go ahead and use them. Niles Gaddy, he's looks pretty good out there. I, yeah. I've been impressed in the small sample size from what we've seen from him. Johnny, you know who's really impressed me? Johnny Walker. That dude's good. He's very good. Like, I don't know why. He, I, I They had good defensive ends. Not a huge deal. But I don't know why he never saw the field a year ago. I feel yeah. like he probably should have gotten some more opportunities, but he's like a le- legitimately really good football player. So use those guys. <laughs> Th- those are your starting defensive ends. And move your all-world defensive tackle who's going to be drafted at some point in like the top 150 picks next year. Use him at defensive tackle. Yeah. Is this this doesn't need to be that hard. No. I love Jaden Jernigan. And I think Rialis George has done, a, those two have done a great job as starters. I think we're going to start feeling the lack of D-Rob if he doesn't move back to tackle soon. So I, I would I would endorse that. You you get worse at two spots. Yeah. yeah he's not as good a defensive end as Johnny Walker. I don't think he's as disruptive as Niles Gaddy. So use those guys, especially on the edge on third downs. Mm-hmm. Kick him inside, and you're good to go. Um, but otherwise, man, I've, I've got very few complaints about this defense. They had a couple of spots where, like, you know, wasn't ideal. But they've been pretty man, damn good this year. Even the best corner is going to get caught on. Like you're not, it's not going to be zero. I, I I would say I'd like to see some more turnovers. We saw a couple of batted passes, a couple of disruption in the backfield, which was better than, than against the FCS team. But like, yeah, see, I got to see an interception. I got to see a fumble recovery at some point. And other than that, 
if you can if you can do this, you know, without that, without the the turnovers, like can't wait to see it when you can. So yeah. I'm I'm okay with that. And those are coming. Like they get so much pressure yeah. on the quarterback, and they are able to disguise things well enough that that that'll get there. It's just a matter of time. Um. Yeah. So, all right, let's get to the other thing. Brady Cook. Brady Cook. I'll let you start. 14, by the way, the stat line. Because if you just didn't watch the game, you would you could you genuinely would not believe that we're about to have this conversation and it might skew negative. 14 for 19. Yep. 205 yards. Yep. Two touchdowns, no picks. Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. I I know that he the opening couple drives against Middle Tennessee was a little bit of a whoa, a little wake up call. Got sacked twice. That wasn't good. Felt a lot more rushed in his reads than, you know, playing an FCS foe. I get it. Should you expect that from a guy who's played 15 games? No, you should probably expect him to be comfortable with that kind of pressure, but I understand it. Again, the big deal is not that he's missing dudes big time. It's it's drops. And yes, I know you went to you went on Twitter last night and talked about the two throws to Burden. One was, you know, probably Burden should have come back. The other one was not good. So like I, I get that there's some bad throws in there. I just uh, I I I I can't find a reason to freak out about it. And that's not what a certain pocket of Missouri fandom wants to hear. So if you're going to tune out, fine. Thanks for listening to for 37 minutes. Like, thank you for your time. I mean, let's, let's go through his, you know, go through his success rates, go through what he's doing. He's hitting running backs, right? He's hitting Schrader. He's hitting Pete. He's hitting Weiss. Really? The big deal is that he is only looking at Luther burden. And if he's, if Luther burden isn't open, then he's probably going to be moving around and kind of scrambling and then dump it off, which is not, it's not the worst thing you can do. Also, there are yeah, ways of doing it. when Theo, when, Theo, Theo had a pretty good game in this one. He did. But when Theo Weiss and the tight ends and this version of Mookie Cooper are your other options on literally every play, I would also look to Luther Bird in a lot. That that would be the route that I would, I would say that is my first option, my second option, my third option, and then I'm checking elsewhere. Yeah. So, I mean, we've seen more passes to the running back this year than I feel like we saw last year, just from a from a load-bearing standpoint, from a decision-making standpoint. Peyton Schrader have been way more active in the passing game than they were last year. Again, should Theo Weiss and Dennis Jackson and Mookie Cooper and, you know, Josh Manning, should those guys be, you know, better and more open and look to more often? Sure, yeah, you could argue that. I would also say a Drinkwitz offense emphasizes the slot receiver and oh by the way for two years now it's been your best receiver so yes he is going to look there like you said first second and third and then either run or dump it off I don't have a problem with that he has zero interceptions (laughs) Sam Horn couldn't say that in five passes I just I understand the sacks not all his fault I understand the safety not all his fault he should have held on to the ball better, but not all his fault. And, like, and, and in that spot, you got to know better than that. Like that, that just can't happen when you're in the fourth quarter up the way that like that, given the context of that scenario, that was a really bad play. And uh, bad. I'll give like, I'll totally concede that one. And maybe I'll even concede the first throw to burden. I think it was, maybe it would have been the second. Um, it was the first one. Yeah. Maybe I'll concede that one too. I thought other than that, he was totally fine, dude. That's the thing that's so weird about the the Brady Cook experience is I don't even know what we're arguing over anymore. Like, did he miss or underthrow Luther Burden on that deep throw? Absolutely. And he's got to connect on that. And guys, he did. Later in the game, he literally connected on the same play. 44 yards. And it was awesome. It rocked. That was great, but he gets no credit for that because he missed on the first one. And then very so, very, very soon thereafter, I, I'm, I wish we had the all twenty two and we could go back and rewatch it because they didn't give us a good angle of this on the broadcast. But I'm pretty sure on the other miss that people point to to Burden, where Burden was just running down the seam mm-hmm. wide open, I'm pretty sure his arm was hit as he was releasing that one, and it impacted the trajectory of the ball. 
if it didn't, bad throw. You got to make it. That's got to be better. But I, I think that's what happened there. So those two were in the first four throws that he made on the day. Nate, he started the day one for four for six yards. Mm -hmm. After that, he was 13 for 15 for 198 yards and two touchdowns. That seems good. You got to be better in the pocket. I think the offensive line stunk in that game. I don't think they did him any favors whatsoever, but, hey, man, avoid getting sacked four times for 31 yards and a fumble against Middle Tennessee State. That'd be ideal, but it happens, whatever. It, it, one of those was a drop by Brett Norfleet that I mentioned in terms of the 13 for 15, so probably should have been 14 for 15 to finish the game. <laughs> I just... I know that some will probably listen to this and say, yeah, BK is doing that because his average depth of target is four yards down the field. There's some truth to that. That's also the offense. And if you hate that, take it up with Eli Drinkwitz, man. That's the way that he runs this thing. Take it up with Kirby Moore. I tried to warn you guys going into this thing. We both did, Nate. Kirby Moore's philosophies offensively are not all that dissimilar from what Eli Drinkwitz was doing a year ago. You saw some of it. You saw the deep over routes to Luther Byrne, and that stuff is sexy, dude. <laughs> I, I I enjoy watching that, but a lot of what we're seeing is, is kind of what they've done in the past. And hey, man, a lot of teams run this kind of an offense. So also keep in thing. mind that uh, McDonald kid, the corner, he broke up two of those passes, like jumped the route on one, like he was just perfectly placed. The other one, he just stuck his stuck his hand in there. So like, guess what? The defense wants to stop those passes too. This isn't seven on seven. Um, so, you know, you add a drop and you add two passes broken up. There's three explained, which, you know, they still exist. I'm not saying they don't, but I don't know. I just have such a hard time being mad at Brady Cook. All my, all my anger is is focused on Eli Drinkwitz clinching up on fourth down. and I, That's not Brady's fault. That's not Kirby's fault. It's just who he is. Do you think that Brady Cook is better than he was last year? So far, yeah, I do. I agree. Do you think the offense... It, forget like the Eli Drinkwitz part of this. That's a hard thing to do. But I know, I know. Do you think they are better than they were last year? I do. I absolutely believe that. I do. They're too. they're being hamstrung by fourth down, but other than that, yeah, the, we're ignoring the Drinkwitz part. I think they're better. And, and I th I think the O line. There were warning signs against Middle Tennessee that it's not as good as we were hoping that it would be this year. Um, I I thought there were moments in that game where it was like, ooh. Whether it was run blocking or pass blocking, there there were some issues in that one. Um, and Middle Tennessee can exploit that to an extent. K-State can exploit that completely. And if they don't get fixed this week, and Eli said that there's going to be some sort of personnel changes, I don't even know what that would mean, but um, that that is something worth keeping an eye on as well. And we'll see what the changes are when they trot out on the field. I just... You change the lawn snapper on extra point attempts, and then you missed an extra point for the first time in three years. Like, I don't, I don't care what you say. Just win the game. My only hope is that e, uh, Eli, <laughs> K-State tends to not be a super disruptive defense, or they haven't in the past. They're more kind of amoeba, just absorb you type. Um, so maybe you don't see the same amount of pressure that you did because – Middle Tennessee is really good at bringing it in a lot of different places and hiding where that is. Yep. And yeah, for an offensive line that hasn't played together as a unit, except for, you know, one game and then what they were currently in. Okay. I get it. Um, so if K-State decides to get aggressive, then I, I would be concerned, but I don't know if they will. That's, that's up to them. They, they they're the old Gary Pingle thing. Like we do what we do and, yeah. and they're not, they're not going to change for Missouri, nor should they, that this is, a program that is operating at an extremely high level right now. So we'll get more into them uh, later in the week, but it's, yeah. it's going to be an incredibly difficult game because this is a very good football team that Missouri is going up against next week. But my, my ultimate conclusion for my takeaways yesterday was it felt like Missouri lost a game that they won. <laughs> yeah. um, and I still feel that way. And it mostly has to do with Eli Drinkwitz. And I don't really know what to make of that because that's not changing. He's not going it's not, anywhere. It's not. So I I just hope that he starts to get a little more aggressive. That's the biggest thing. If he's it, 
willing to get a little bit more aggressive. I think the ceiling for this season is still where it was whenever we talked two weeks ago. You know, mm-hmm. like this this team has the has the talent, has the potential to be able to make some waves in the SEC. And maybe this is where we should end, Nate. I saw I texted you about this yesterday. Dude, I am not impressed with this conference. It is <laughs> not imposing. Rough day yesterday. They stink, dude. Yeah. Like, the Pac-12 is definitively better than this conference. And I know SEC fans are going to get mad because this is their baby. But no, dude. Your conference is not as good this year. Bama's a little bit down this season. Tennessee's a little bit down this season. The quarterback play overall in the conference is not great. That's the problem. That's the problem. And when you have a... There is has never really been the middle ground, in my opinion, that people have suggested that there is in the SEC. Um, oh, yeah. Like, eh. people spout the depth of the conference. It's fine. I, I don't particularly believe that it's significantly better than some of the depth at other conference. The truth is the top four in this conference is always better than other conferences. Um, and I don't know that any of that is true this year. It's just, it's, it's very soft. They still recruit better than most every other team out there, other than Ohio State or Texas, which is joining the SEC or Michigan, you know, or USC. But I understand what you're saying. I think it's all based off of tradition, investment, and recruiting. And, and it should be. That that's all reason to believe in a team coming into the season. And then the games are played and then everything changes. Yeah. Like now, yeah. then we get to find out are these teams actually good or not? Texas AM, mm-hmm. not actually good. Not not good. Oh just just not good. Vanderbilt has not taken a significant st- step forward. Kentucky, I have not been impressed at all by what oh, we've God seen so God. far from Kentucky. They got Devin Leary and their offense might be worse than it's it was bad. last year. And last year wasn't good. Arkansas. What the hell was that dude? 28 to six against Kent state who was last at SP plus going into last week. I believe it, it's, it's quarterback play. It's it, you nailed it. There's a hard reset. And that's why I was feeling optimistic coming into this season. I'm like, yeah. Oh, everyone's got a new quarterback there. You know, what's going to happen. I just, can you can you name the one Power Five team that the SEC has beaten so far this year? It was it yesterday the the Arizona. Oh, I guess it's two Mississippi now. State. Yeah, yeah. So that one in Cal. The, I think Auburn ended up beating Cal as well. But what, oh, what was like it Cal last one. week? Okay, well anyway, Virginia. No, oh, well yeah, and they stink. They're terrible. Well, poor Virginia. So I mean, Alabama loses to Texas, which again is SEC game, but you know whatever. And everyone else like. Just struggle bus, baby. And that you get the hard reset. One of the lowest returning productions, kind of as a conference, like, and you get new quarterbacks. Like this is, this is the time to stink. And Eli, it's right there for the taking, man. It really is, dude. It really is. Be aggressive. Be aggressive, Ed. You should be Memphis. You should be Vandy. I, I, I think you. I will not pick them to beat LSU, but they can beat LSU. Kentucky's looking prettier. I think they should beat Kentucky. I think South Carolina being at home, that should be a win. Obviously, Georgia's going to be – you're not beating them. Um, Tennessee at home I think is doable. I, I really do. I think that's crazy to say out loud, and I will pick Tennessee going into that week, but it is at home, and you're going up Motivated. against a quarterback who doesn't know where it's going whenever he throws it. Um, he knows it's going far, just not yeah. which direction. <laughs> Florida should be a win. At Arkansas is in play. Yeah. I just, I basically told you like one game that I think is a definite loss down the stretch, and it comes down to can he beat Kansas State? Yeah. That's it. If you beat Kansas State this week, nothing about what happened against Middle Tennessee matters anymore. Nothing. Nothing matters. It's, and you can beat them three to two. <laughs> Nobody Going will back care. to this one. <laughs> I do not care how it happens. Oh. Just. Beat them. Just beat them. Just win, baby. Just go win, dude. Just go win. All right. Just let them all hang out. out. Big balls, drink wits. Let's do this, baby. Let them let them bounce. Let them go. Please, baby Jesus. <laughs> Six Sweet pound, baby eight ounce, Jesus. baby Jesus. Smile upon us. We'll talk more about that this week. But for now, that's going to be our show for today. As always, we appreciate the downloads and the subscriptions. Leave a comment or raise. We love all types of feedback from you all. You can follow us on Twitter at Matt and H.E. Edwards. He's at BK Sports Talk. And, of course, you can follow the Rock M flagship at Rock M Nation and the podcasting outlet at Rock M Radio. We appreciate you tuning in this time. We'll try to do better next time. And until then, M-I-Z. Z-O-U.
Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Rock M Radio, a proud partner of Fans for a Sports Network. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to see more, just like it being directly into your personal device, just click the subscribe button below. Beep. Uh, and you can find this podcast through the Apple Podcast app or for iPhone or the Google Podcast app for Android or whatever app you use to listen to your podcast. Uh, we are also available on Spotify. Just search for Rock M Radio. Uh, and if you like other sports, Fans First Sports Network uh, is a podcast network that has uh, coverage of all other teams, Major League Baseball, uh, MLS, uh, NFL, whatever you want uh, to listen and, and read about. It is a great, great network full of really fantastic podcasts. So look them up and subscribe uh, to any and all of those podcasts. Uh, Rock M Radio will be back with more episodes coming soon. Thanks.